G'day, everyone. Thank you for joining me for episode 17 of Think Mental, a podcast that simplifies mental health and encourages conversation. For anyone that is new to the podcast, Think Mental is a platform where we aim to discuss all things mental health and provide young people with strategies on how to better understand their feelings and emotions. Mental health disorders do not discriminate. And here at Think Mental, we want to simplify the way in which you tackle them. So thanks again for choosing to check out this podcast. This week, we have yet another inspiring guest on to tell her story of addiction and mental health. Our guest is one of the more enthusiastic and friendly people you'll meet. She's a 27-year-old counselling student from the Sunshine Coast who began her journey of sobriety on the 22nd of August 2019, whilst also changing the way we look at mental health for good through her amazing Instagram blog, The Anxiety Bender. Our guest is also part of the In Crowd, which is a non-for-profit collective providing support, education, services for individuals, families and communities with disabilities, mental health issues and challenges and homelessness. If that doesn't tell you enough, she also runs a free mental health and addiction support group called Fuck Stigmas, which you can find more info for via her Instagram. Brooke and Garrett, aka the Anxiety Bender, aka Brookie G. How the heck are you? <laughs> well, wow, what an introduction. I'm like kind of flattered. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Um, how are you doing? Good, good. I, it's um you don't realize how much you do until someone else talks about it, right? I know, it's kind of like Whoa, that sounds like a lot. Who is yeah, that person? <laughs> exactly. No, thank oh, you. So, thank you Jimmy. so much. Yeah. And we've, you know, we've been chatting on and off for the last couple of weeks and um, we're getting to a point now where we're really pumped to have this story out here. And, you know, your journey so far has been absolutely phenomenal and so pumped to just have it from your own words, really. And like you said, yeah, um, today you, you've had it, got it on paper, but it, it's the first time that you've actually spoken about it. So, really stoked and actually grateful that I'm the first to talk about it or ask about it. Yeah, absolutely. Like what you said, it's, I definitely write about my story a lot on the anxiety bender, um, but I've never actually vocalized my story with someone else before. So I'm really excited to be sharing this with you for the first time through my voice, which Mm. is something, um, I've always struggled with over the years is using my voice. So this is kind of big for me and I'm really excited to be here. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and it's interesting you say that because you're, you are very bubbly and energetic and I think, and even strong-minded and that's how your page comes across is very strong-minded and, and motivational in the sense that it's like, fuck, like you said, fuck stigmas in your support group and being very aggressive in, in a positive manner about, you know, fuck, we can do this kind of thing. And that's the attitude you have, which is so surprising to hear you say, you know, you struggle to actually voice it. But um, for people out there who haven't come across you yet um, or may have just started to learn who you are, talk about, or give us an overview of who you are and what your life is at the moment and what it's looking like. Yeah, absolutely. So my name's Brooklyn, a.k.a. Brookie G. (laughs) Um, I am originally from Cronulla down south in Sydney. I moved up to the sunny coast almost 15 months ago to work in a mental health recovery and addiction recovery centre called the Health Retreat. Um, I was a client there once upon a time. Uh, That's kind of what kick-started my sobriety journey. Uh, Basically, at the moment, my... I feel like my whole life journey now is about removing the stigmas and spreading awareness around addiction and mental health for young people and older adults as well. Um, I do a lot of self-reflection on a daily basis that helps me write these posts, I suppose, and I do try and come from a very raw place they are very much so not they're very much so not filtered (laughs) if you've read any of my posts I swear and I speak very much so from my heart um my fuck stigmas group I literally was sitting there one day and I was like what do I call this group it's something I've wanted to do for a very long time and I was like you know what I fucking hate stigmas like they are the reason why half of us 
be quiet and suffer alone. So why don't we just remove them for good and literally fuck them off? <laughs> mm. So I thought, nah, I'm calling it Fuck Stigmas. It just has to be that name. Mm. Um, at the moment, I am currently studying counselling and I'm a life coach as well. So a holistic life coach. And I look at wellness and helping people to basically their best life. Um, I believe that the best way to move forward in life is to release traumas, to release the past and find out what is actually going on on a, in a subconscious level, um, you know, because anxiety, depression, addiction is just surface layer. Where is that coming from? Um, finding that, acknowledging it, looking at it and releasing it. And I do that through art therapy. I do that through EFT, which is a modal emotion, emotional freedom technique, uh, tapping, uh, where we tap on meridian points of the body. So on the face, usually like the eyebrow, the sides of the temples, the under the eye socket, upper lip, chin, head, under the ribs, and also the karate point. Um, and then I also do things like exercise release as well with my clients because I was a qualified personal trainer a long time ago um, I still am qualified that didn't change but I just obviously haven't practiced as a personal trainer for a while but exercise for me is something that is massive in my life and I loved being a PT loved it so much mm -hmm. so I do a lot of release work with my clients kind of bring the therapy space into the exercise if that makes sense mm, cool and how many how many clients have you got going at the moment? Is, it, um, is there a waiting list or how do people actually get in touch with you as well is probably my second question to that. Um, so basically, I if you do want to book in for a session, I usually just do them through Instagram. So if you're interested in booking in, send me a DM and I can let you know in detail about everything I do. Um, I don't have many clients because I try to keep my clientele small so I can deliver a quality service. Mm. Um, I don't believe that you need me forever because once I give you the tools, they're your tools. And then mm. it's just maintaining it. You can check in. I kind of like to keep myself as a bit of an accountability coach as well to my clients. So you know, you've always got me, I'm always there, you know, I'll always mm. pick up the phone um, and help my clients through things. We do a lot of journey, journaling as well, like release work through journaling. I think journaling is a massive, massive mm. thing. My anxiety bender page is basically my online journal. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so journaling, I never used to journal and it saved my life. So I do a lot of that with my clients as well, male and female, mm. um, men, you know, it, it's funny. I have a few male clients that come to me and I'm like, okay, we're going to do this journaling. And they kind of look at me like, what? And I'm like, trust me, dude, just start writing. It's, you'll feel good. And they start writing and they're like, oh my God, <laughs> I'm starting to figure things out about myself that I didn't even realize I knew. Mm. Um, so, yeah. Okay, so let's just for everyone listening, what, what's the direction you want to take the anxiety bender? What's the theme of, of the actual page itself? So the anxiety bender, I to remove stigmas around addiction and mental health. Um, I created it for men and women to relate to my stories um, and the stories of others through this platform. I suppose the direction of the anxiety vendor is to create as much awareness um, as possible to everyone. You know, I want people to know that you're not alone. I think the biggest thing with mental health and addiction is it's really easy to feel like you are the only person on this planet going through this right now. I really wish I had that um that relatability with someone to go, oh my God, they get it. Because mm. um, yeah. I didn't know that that there was mental health podcasts. I didn't know that there was Instagram pages talking about this stuff. I kind of only started to see that now, um, you know, so I, I really want that to be a widespread thing for people to 
come and relate and, you know, feel connected. Connection is the opposite of addiction and connection is the opposite of mental illness. That is something I live by. And the more we can have people feeling connected, the less addiction issues, the less mental health issues, the less, you know, suicidal attempts, the less everything negative that comes in that circle will happen. Because I know for me, I had connection with people through my friends, through socialising. But when it came to my mental health, I really struggled to find that connection with people who really understood what it was I was going through. Um, and my friends were so supportive. And I remember my friends, like I, I opened up to them one day and they were like, oh, I had no idea you were going through this. And, you know, it's, it's hard to connect with people if they don't, if they've never really experienced anxiety or depression to the level I felt I was experiencing it, mm. where I was sitting at home wanting to die mm. or just not eating for a couple of days or binge eating at the other end of the scale just to numb the pain during the week. Like it was a never ending circle and I want people to know that it's okay to feel like this. It's okay to have these battles and these addictions and these mental health, you know, things that come up, but you're not alone. And you don't have to suffer in silence and you don't have to suffer alone. And there is a light at the end of the tunnel, you know, that these things that we experience don't last forever. Mm. And it's a sense of familiarity, like you said, feeling connected, but also pages like yours and hopefully like mine, where we kind of keep it simple in a way. Um, I think you're way more, obviously way more qualified than I am in terms of the, the psychological and the wellness and the holistic side of things. But from, a, if you strip it right back, making it simple in terms of how, you, like you said, you, you, know, you swear and you keep it very like casual in a sense it's like familiar. It's like, Oh fuck. Like they're talking, like talking about mental health and addiction, <laughs> like it's nothing. And that actually probably feels better. Well, I, but it is simple, really. Like mm. we all go through it and yeah, there's science behind how the brain works and why we have anxiety and why we get depression and why we have addictive behaviors. But at the end of the day, it's pretty simple. Mm. You know, it's for some of us, it's everyday life. So why put big words, fancy, you know, <laughs> fancy joining sentences on a blog where all I'm trying to do is just relate to people and speak from my truth and speak a language that we kind of all universally understand. Mm. You know, a lot of us don't go around saying, fuck this, fuck that. But <laughs> in our heads, we, we probably do. We're probably like, oh, fuck, I'm sick of feeling like this. You know, yeah. I'm sick fucking always life beating me down I'm sick of feeling like you know the only way to feel good is by hitting another high of whatever that is sex drugs alcohol gambling whatever it is it's a euphoric state that addicts live in to feel good mm. you know they use that to master and that feeling of always chasing that euphoria can be fucking exhausting it's yeah. exhausting do you think because, especially when you've got a uh, what's the word a tolerance for it if they if you're when your tolerance increases it becomes more hard to find yeah absolutely i think i think with for, from speaking from my experience i kind of called myself a universal addict <laughs> in the sense that i didn't just have one poison um, you know, I didn't have one drug or, you know, alcohol was the only thing I used, you know, yeah, I used drugs and alcohol on the weekends to <laughs> copious amounts, you know, three, four day benders. But during the week, I wasn't really a drug user and I wasn't really an alcohol user either. Yeah. There was the occasional thirsty Thursday where it would carry me on to the weekend, but my, 
my weekdays consisted of, you know, binging on food, meeting up with boys, like trying to fill a void, you know, binge watching TV, exercise isn't even started to become a problem. Like nothing was ever done at an equilibrium. It was always done at a huge level of an extreme or nothing. Mm. So there was no happy medium. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think like what you said before about addicts and always trying to chase that high, like, you know, once it starts to kind of level out a little bit, it is really easy to freak out and, you know, you going and going and finding a new thing or if you do have one poison, then you take it to a whole new level because a lot of us are adrenaline junkies, right? We love adrenaline. Mm -hmm. Um, So a big part of me getting sober and my, my counselor even said this to me as well in rehab, she said it to the whole class. She was like, you know, it's really easy for me to sit here and tell you that you need to go and do yoga and you need to do meditation and you need to do journaling and you need to do this and that and all this stuff to quieten the mind. But for people who are addicts, we seek that adrenaline, you know, that hit of something. Mm. so eventually we need to match that hit with something but something that's good for us something that's going to actually benefit us not try and kill us Mm. so for me I was like okay and that was probably a really good piece of advice because I was like right that makes sense and I think that's why I'd always failed to get sober in the past is I'd be like oh this is like okay this is great like I feel good but I'm getting bored Mm, mm. so for me I do things that are going to give me that hit of dopamine in a good way so for my one year sober I jumped out of a plane you know I get tattoos because tattoos make me feel just the way I did when I used to get drugs and they're not bad for me I actually enjoy it it's expressive it's a part of me showing who I am through an art form Mm. um so that kind of thing it's about finding something that you can match even boxing, boxing was a huge thing for me. Kicking the shit out of a bag makes me feel so like it's the biggest hit rush. Like who needs drugs, mm, you know? Mm. Um, so finding things like that yeah. was a really way of me getting sober. Yeah, that's a good point. And we'll touch on on other things that you do and how you've got through to where you are now. But we'll start at the start so everyone gets a really thorough context of why you are who you are, why the oh, anxiety okay. better started. Here we go. <laughs> uh, so this is the juicy stuff. Um, but, yeah, I think it's a really good point of context. So talk to us what what the main so, – sort of from the start. Let's start from the start, you know, how your story began as a young person and where it sort of led to um, – up until the point of of obviously having to go sober? So my story as a real, my story kind of goes in a a bit of a wave, really. It's had, it's had um, from when I was a young teenager, um, you know, there was lots of ups and downs. It kind of went on a good path, then it went on a bad path, then it went on a good path, then it went on a bad path. Um, You know, my life as a little one, you know, zero to five, relatively normal. You know, I spent a lot of time with my nan and pop. Um, you know, family was good. I had a good upbringing. You know, I never went without. Um, I suppose things started to get, when I, was, when I was younger, I always kind of felt I had some friends and I knew that, I knew that things had gone on in that circle. You know, I knew that things for me started to change. There were rules being put in place for me of where I couldn't couldn't go as a little one. And when I was that young, I'm probably talking like maybe six years old, I didn't really understand why. I just remember being told no. And I later on found out that when my nan when my nan passed away, I remember I did a lot of like self-reflective inner journey work and 
I was trying to figure out why I had all this anxiety, where it was coming from, why I had so many relationship issues. And I did this inner journey work and tapped into some subconscious memories and this memory of a next door neighbor, it was an older man, was about 60 years old, popped up into my head. And this memory wasn't really overly nice. Um, And I knew straight away and it was weird because it wasn't like I'd ever thought about this person ever again. I kind of like when, but as soon as I, as soon as it popped up in my mind, I knew exactly what had happened. I felt all the emotions of that five-year-old girl being scared and, and whatnot. Anyway, I had confirmation from family that, you know, and they were really upset. They were kind of crying. I asked them about this incident and they were like, yeah, you know, we knew that that had happened and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, okay. You know, and I, I kind of always struggled to understand why people kind of maybe never address that with me as that five-year-old girl. But I now understand that it's not their fault. They were trying to protect me, you know, and keep me safe and give me a normal life. So I understand that, but I do believe that a lot of what happened, even as that five-year-old girl, that had a ripple effect of what then transpired later on in life. Um, so I suppose around 10 and at school, I was really badly bullied at school. Like I was a very vibrant, bubbly person, like what I am now. Like that is my authentic self, very vibrant. You know, I loved the Simpsons. I used to wear like the weirdest clothes. I would wear, you know, bright colored clothing, all the same color. I would wear long socks with all rainbow colors on them. You know, I was very social. I loved to have my friends around and, you know, talk to everyone, but obviously that kind of personality, that vibrant personality, unfortunately, is a target for bullies, right? So, you know, I got very badly bullied by a lot of the older kids in primary school about the way I looked, about my face, about my body shape. I was always very tall and, you know, solid and, you know, the, all the easy stuff for people to pay you out about that happened. And the bullying didn't stop. It kind of, you know, rippled on into high school. And, you know, I, I always remember like kind of like trying to fight it and just be, you know, who I am and still be vibrant and bubbly. But then I, in high school, it, that kind of changed. I started to kind of try to be with the cool crowd because if I was with the cool crowd then that you know I would be safe you know if you're not a loser and you're with the cool crowd like this toxic mentality then no one will be mean to me um unfortunately that's not what happened and I suppose I at home I would try and talk about you know what was going on and I never felt like my voice was being heard I always felt like I was kind of all too much for everyone to hear or I was just told to be quiet and get over it and just you know don't listen to it it's fine like you know just keep moving on you know do you think your family didn't have much understanding around that that side of things yet or at all when I reflect no that's okay when I reflect back on it I, I really think that my family did the best that they could like I do remember them trying to it was, it was more, I'm, you know, they went to the school, they talked to the teachers, they did all that kind of stuff, but that kind of made it worse. And I was struggling. Like I started acting out in anger. There were fights in the home, like insane fights, you know, throwing, swearing, physical fights on my behalf. Like I was so frustrated and so upset and angry about what was going on to me at school that I had and I felt like no one would just listen to me it was like okay well there's bullies at school we need to fix that problem so we're going to tell the teachers and we're going to do this and we're going to do that but now move on Mm. that's how I felt 
when that wasn't what was happening, it was kind of like eating away at me. And I just never felt like I could talk about it or be completely heard. It was more like, let, let's try and fix the problem at hand, make these bullies shut up, but it never worked, <laughs> mm. you know? And I know now, if anything, it kind of just made it worse. Mm. I needed to be strong and I wasn't. Um, then when I was in year 10, it was the beginning of year 10, I was bashed at school. I suppose I can say, um, well, yeah, I'm not going to suppose I say it. It's, I was bashed at school, got taken away in an ambulance. (laughs) And I remember the day of that happening, I like walked into the playground and everyone was talking, like everyone was talking about me and saying that I had slept with some girl's boyfriend, which I never did. And I will happily say on this podcast, that never happened. (laughs) Mm. and I was like I didn't do that and they were like you know these this year 12 girl and these two girls in my year they were like we're gonna you know bash you at lunchtime and this that the other and being myself absolutely petrified because Mm. the whole school was around there was one girl in my year one girl she was the only person who actually spoke to me and was like it's going to be okay like you know everyone else I was the it was like I'd had coronavirus at school everyone was kind of like did not want to talk to me because I was you know the enemy now and anyway we went down into the playground and surely enough the fight happened and it was pretty traumatic like I remember you know it it happened really fast the whole school was around this quadrangle watching it happen I got taken away in an ambulance I then got suspended with this girl as well for the fight happening even though I didn't start it and I remember that two weeks of suspension being so lonely and I think that's when I first experienced what I would call depression um I remember being really scared to go back to school because I felt like a loser, I suppose. I felt like I was going to have no friends. And when I left, when I left, you know, two weeks suspension and I went back to school, I remember I walked in with two girls who were meant to be my friends. We walked down to our little play area, playground area, and I sat down and the girl who had assaulted me walked up with a group of girls and the two girls that were sitting with me stood up, walked over with her, walked over to her. They looked at me, started laughing. And I remember sitting there going, I can't do this. Like I refuse to go through this anymore. And I got up and I walked home and I never went back to that school again. And yeah, it was that after that, it was horrible. The amount of online harassment I received it was my space back in the day um you know people were making like I don't know if you had my space or know what my space is but you could create like a profile and you could write like little blurbs about things on there people would have on their myspace pages blurbs about me you know calling me a slut and I'm talking we were 15 years old calling me a slut, you know, telling me, saying I was ugly, all this kind of stuff, just complete harassment. And I remember sitting in my parents' granny flat, just scared. Like I had no friends. I was like, I'm a full loser. No one was listening to me. The fights at home got worse and worse and worse. And this was probably one of the first times I've ever felt like this, but I remember sitting there just wanting to die. I was like, is is this all I am (laughs) like I can't live like this I'm a loser like I am always going to be that loser no one likes me no one listens to me no one's listening to me at home no one's listening to me at school no one fucking cares Mm. you know and I finished my year 10 at TAFE um So when I was at TAFE, I met some pretty colourful people because, you know, they were like a lot older than me. There were, you know, your typical, there was a few lads there and like everything was very, 
different. It opened my eyes to a different world. And in that time, I met some people who were probably not on paper the best people to probably get involved with, but they accepted me for who I was. And they really liked me and they protected me. And I started to, you know, talk to them. I remember I had a, got, met this guy through this group and he was like, you know, if someone says something bad to you, you just need to stand up for yourself and just like, you know, beat them, like, you know, go for it. And I kind of turned into the bully, I suppose. And I started, you know, because I remember down at Miranda Fair, which is like the Westfield where I was from, we all used to go there on a Thursday night and hang out in the bus bays and smoke cigarettes and think we were really cool. And before, before I met these people, I used to be so scared to go down there because everyone was there. And like, I remember being threatened to be bashed again. And it was so horrible. Like I just thought I was anywhere I went and I felt like I was going to get assaulted by these people. And I then thought, well, fuck, I have to step my game up and be that person that they can't assault. And, you know, anyone, I was so fucking angry that anyone who, you know, messed with me, looked at me in a different way. It was, it was done for, like, I had no problem stamping my authority because all I wanted was someone to fucking listen to me. And it would have felt so it would have felt so powerful going from someone who had no defense, had nothing to fight back with, and all of a sudden all of this power and an ability to to be protected first and foremost, but then you know, have this almost um, I guess authorization from your friends to go like go fucking go for it. Yeah, and I, I and that's what it was, and they were like a family to me. And because I suppose at home my own family wasn't really listening to me and there was lots of fights like that family dynamic was quite you know volatile during this period um because I felt like I wasn't being listened to and I ended up getting kicked out of home at 15 and I lived with a 20 21 year old and these people who were like kind of like yeah no fuck that like anyone who you know, does you wrong, you tell them to get fucked and you punch them in the face. <laughs> mm. So I was kind of like, okay, cool. Like now I'm the strong one. Now I'm the scary one. Like, you know, mm. I can protect myself and that's who I am now. It was the, I suppose you're right. It, it was empowering mm. to go from the loser to the one who was kind of wearing the pants, I suppose. Yeah. So talk me through where the, the the addiction side came from and where that all started. Um, so I suppose like living out of home, I was practically living on the streets. So I was, you know, I had I was living with a twenty one year old, and then I was like couch surfing pretty much. I think I've calculated I lived in 22 homes by the age of 21 or something like that and you know I was always around I think I remember my very first boyfriend smoking crack out of a light bulb um, when I was 15 so drugs were like very much in my vicinity from very very early on um I myself, I never had, I didn't touch drugs until I like party drugs until I was about 18, but I used to drink a lot. I drank a lot, you know, I'm talking like practically almost a goon bag a night. Like it was a lot of alcohol and I was, you know, mixing with prescription drugs. So doing Valiums and Xanax and um, I smoked a bit of pot here and there. And when I was about uh, oh, maybe 16 and a half, 17. My nan actually contacted me one day and was kind of like, you need to come and move into my house. 
mm. you know, because I was getting in trouble with the police and all sorts of things. And she's like, if you don't come move in with me, like, I'm afraid of what's going to happen to you. Like, you're probably going to end up in jail. So I ended up moving in with her. And although I didn't smarten up my act straight away, she got me into school. Um, she was very sick. She was terminally ill with cancer. And she was kind of like my rock. Like she always had my back. She understood me and she got me back into school and I, you know, started to get on a better path. Like I was, you know, made new friends. They stopped telling me to talk like an Eshe and speaking in pig Latin <laughs> and wearing TNs to school. Cause I went to Cronulla high school. It was a surf school. So like wearing TNs at school was definitely not a thing. Um, so and- wearing, no- wearing no shoes was a thing maybe. <laughs> yeah, like legit. It was like I walked in there and I'm like, oh, Eshe cars. And they're all like, no, you cannot talk like that here. <laughs> um, so I made some like amazing friends, met my group of friends with to this day. Um, and then, you know, obviously, you know, I went to festivals and started, I, I had an older boyfriend. So I started experimenting with like pills and MDMA and Coke and all this kind of stuff. And you know, I feel like at that time it was pretty normal for me to be experimenting with these kind of things. And then my nan died, um, which was and still is the hardest thing I've ever gone through. And I feel like when she died, I never really dealt with it properly. And I didn't deal with it until I went to rehab. I still, to this day, even to this day, she died like almost seven years ago. I still think it's three. Like, I just don't want to accept it. Um, But I knew that I had to, you know. And during that time period of when she passed away, I honestly feel that's when my, you know, drug and alcohol use went to like a whole new extreme. Um, I was, you know, bending for like two, three days. I was, you know, snorting that much cocaine. I don't know how my nose didn't fall off. Like it was just, you know, getting to the point where it was kind of ridiculous. And I suppose near the end, um, of it, well, actually I, so I was put on medication at 15, um, anxiety medication, and I was never like reviewed for that ever. And I was on it for 10 years. So at 24, I remember sitting in my room being super suicidal. I was just sitting there, like I'd probably been, been on a bender and, I just remember feeling like shit and this medication used to give me really bad withdrawal. So if I didn't have it that night, by the next day, I would be getting like brain fog, body shudders and a tingly left face. And I remember like feeling like, fuck, is this medication like even doing something? Like, honestly, like it's just not working. And this guy that I had known for quite some time and I used to party with a lot had gone to rehab um, to, you know, help himself and fix his mental health because he was also struggling very much so. And I started to think like, oh, is that a thing? Like, can I, can I do something like that? Like, I feel like I'm pretty fucked right now. And like I was getting to the point where I would like drive from my house to work and not even remember the drive because all I was thinking about was the fact that I didn't want to live anymore. And like laying in my bed being like, like it hurting, like it physically hurting my heart. Even when I actually feel it, like just wanting to die. And the fact that I felt like I couldn't was even more painful. Like I actually couldn't do it. And I was like, I can't fucking live like this any longer. Um, what, what, so I went not, to my- Just to cut in there, what do you think the reasons were that meant, meant you couldn't do it? Because I think there's so many different, different people have different reasons why they can't follow through. And that's a very real situation for a lot of people that have had mental health and are going through it at the moment, if you're listening. And, and it's inevitable that sometimes that thought pops in and- you know, where, how far you go is, is very different for everyone. But I think it's a really important understanding for you, for other people listening, what you think was the reason for not doing it. 
I guess, or following through? Um, I suppose I've got a couple of reasons and oh, sorry, it's like making me emotional talking about these because it's actually like bringing me back to that, that moment. Um, and if I'm really honest, I've like, this is, I have those moments, they've still happened, you know, and I think the, the big reason why I couldn't do it was I almost knew that deep down, like my intuitive side or whether it was my nan or like whatever it was, it was like this little voice in my head that was like, fucking don't like, this is not who you are. Like you can get through this. Mm. It was like, in that moment, even though I was in so much pain, so much pain, it was like this physical block, this physical block where I just couldn't do it. Because I think deep down, even with all the darkness, I knew that this was not the answer. Mm. And I think in that time, that was why I was in so much pain because I was like, I can't live like this. Mm. Like it hurts. It yeah. physically hurts. Um, you know, I wasn't eating. I wasn't sleeping. I wouldn't see my friends. And, you know, I just couldn't do it anymore. Mm. It, it was, it was tough. And to be honest, like, that suicidality is real and I've felt that maybe six months ago I in March I was really burnt out from work really struggling my self-care routine which I'll talk about later and why that's so important I completely let myself go and I was just giving 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 you know, and not dealing with myself because you have to fill your cup up first. And I got to this point where I felt like I wanted to relapse. Mm. And then I was so strong in the fact that I didn't want to relapse that I felt like the only way out was the fact that I, I just couldn't live like this anymore. I felt like that's it. And I actually laid on my floor ready to do it. <laughs> And I talk about universal timing, a um, really good friend of mine called like within seconds of me making a split decision that could have changed my life forever. And I remember looking at the phone and being like, I'll answer that. And she goes, I just had this horrible feeling that I just needed to call you. Like, are you okay? And I just burst into tears and I like told her everything. I was on the phone to her for like four hours and like, you know, stripped it right back. And, you know, we realized that I just needed to take a minute, take some time off, get back to my self-care routine because that is so important and just kind of start again. Mm -hmm. You know, I was putting so much pressure on myself to perform and be good and be sober and do this and do that. And like, study and help people and do all this, but I forgot about myself. So the biggest lesson from that was, you know, and it didn't, I didn't just bounce back straight away. Like it took time, but I knew what to do. And that was the difference between, you know, before when I was like 24 years old and this experience to now is I knew what to do. And I knew that talking to someone was going to be the best thing to do that I didn't have to suffer in silence and do you think a, a point there that's really important to note is that I'm assuming I'm only assuming that you the friend you're talking to probably didn't have a degree in psychology or counseling no they just no like, absolutely not they were just a really close friend of mine mm. um, which I think is kind of beautiful because it was like she just said that she just intuitively had this feeling that she needed to call me and you know I don't know again if someone was looking out for me that day but I'm thankful that they did you know mm. um and that's, and that's the, the person that's why I wanted to note that was 
if you do talk, if anyone talks to people, it doesn't have to be a professional. And that, and that might be your way of it helping. It doesn't have, you don't have to do a back and forth as a therapist. You can just do, a, have a just chat to a friend and they can listen. They Absolutely. don't have to give you advice. They don't have to say a word. Say a word. I think getting it off your chest and actually speaking about it is the 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 biggest thing on, in healing and moving forward and breaking that um, cycle and that vortex. It's like a cyclone, right? You just need something like a circuit breaker to come in and go, "Fuck, just chill, like mm. stop, stop. Let's take a breath. You know, let's let's breathe because this yeah. is not the answer right now." And going back to being that twenty four year old. I never spoke about this to anyone. I like probably had a couple of friends who one or two who got it and they were, to be completely honest, the reason why I probably like actually got through it because I could talk to them about it. I ended up going and speaking to a doctor to potentially get off my medication. And this doctor told me that I had to just go and quit a cold turkey and sit in a room for two weeks and I was like, oh dude, are you, are you like, okay? Like that is the most irresponsible thing I've ever heard. And I even knew that. Um, so I started, you know, Googling and researching um, rehabs and, you know, recovery detox centers. And I took myself to South Pacific Private in Curl Curl, Sydney. And I did a 21 day rehabilitation program where I detoxed off my medication it was in there that is when I started to probably realize that I actually had a problem with drugs and alcohol um subconsciously <laughs> to be right. honest so it wasn't a moment in particular where you like overdosed or got too drunk where you just went fuck like I need it I need help no that that did happen because it was a slow burn I believe in this thing of like it was like the seed had been planted um but it wasn't until something drastic and my life really started to go into shambles that I had to go to another rehab. So I've been to rehab twice mm. and, you know, pull it, strip it away and really make a decision of whether I was going to be sober or not. Mm. Um, well, in- talk through the first, talk through the first time you went and the experiences you had there in those 21 days first, and then we can touch on obviously the second part. So in that, hospital I remember walking in there and there was obviously like people who from all walks of life like all walks of life I was in a psychiatric hospital with 60 people um and I remember sitting down and one of the guys said to me oh so what's your poison like what are you in here for and I was like uh detoxing off my prescription medication and he's like oh I'm a sex addict and I was like holy shit okay and then like you know another guy goes around he's like oh I'm addicted to heroin and I was like fuck and I like ran over to a nurse and just started crying and I was like I don't I shouldn't be here like you know I I don't think I fit in and she's like just relax just wait go to group and see what happens so I ended up going to group and it was funny because over that 21 days I realized that addicts are people too and that these people were experiencing life just the way I was they were just using drugs and alcohol to mask their pain or gambling or sex or whatever it is and that psychiatrist in there he (laughs) he was like in shock because he goes to me I don't know why you were ever put in put on this medication in the first place and I still to this day have no idea what that psychiatrist when I was 14 diagnosed me with I don't know why I was put on this drug this drug was very um, specific to a particular disorder being OCD, which I do have, but not to the amount that it needed to be medicated. Mm. Um, and I was on an extremely high dosage. Like it was a very high dosage. Was so it a SSRI, is that what it's called? Yeah, so it was an SSRI medication called fluvoxamine. Mm. Um, he was kind of like, I don't really see many people on this medication. So he's like, I, I you know, doing, going through my stuff with me. He's like, I don't really understand why you were put on this. And it was the, for the first time ever, cause it just became a part of my life. Like being 14, being put on this medication, I never questioned it. I just took it cause I was told to. So I did. And at 24, I was started to be like, no, I don't understand like why I was on this. So I started to question it. 
And anyway, he put me on 100 milligrams of Valium and 100 milligrams of Seroquel to detox off this medication. Yeah. And yeah, that's a lot. Um, and I kind of said, you know, I'm not, because he didn't want to quit me off at cold turkey, but I'm very strong willed. And I said, no, I'm fucking getting off this medication. And like, I need to know my brain without it because the things that I've been having, these suicidal thoughts, these, you know, this anxiety, I want to know if this is me or the medication making me feel like this was a reaction. So we detox off it. And on my third day of detox, I got so sick. I had a temperature of 41 degrees. My blood pressure dropped right low. I couldn't open my eyes. I was basically borderlining a seizure. Um, and cause I was refusing to take the Valium and the Seroquel. So I now understand why these medications are important. You know, sometimes you need them to detox up things. And I had withdrawals from this medication for six months consistently. <laughs> it was a lot. And it made me realize how much this medication had like, was controlling my brain really like, from 14 to 24, that's like your whole adolescent. Like I didn't even know how to think properly without this medication. Mm. Who, who was I? Like, <clears throat> am I this person? That's, that was my big question. It was like a big question mark. Like, who am I? How do I even think? Is it actually me or is it the medication? So then when I was leaving the hospital, I got, you get like a discharge sheet and on my discharge sheet, the hospital the psychiatrist had diagnosed me with alcohol abuse disorder and I remember looking at that and I was like um fucking okay like I'm 24 I'm just having a good time and that was my story throughout the whole time in that hospital I had to go to an AA meeting I had to talk to other addicts and they'd be like Brooke like what you're telling us is actually like sounds like you've got a problem and I'm like please I'm 24 I'm just having fun and when I left the hospital, I still did my usual behaviors. I was still partying. I think it was three days out. I went and got on a, I think it was a Wednesday night. I went on a, got on a Coke bender with a friend, like nothing changed in that, that, you know, that level. The only thing that had changed was the fact that I didn't have this medication. And I, I honestly think like after getting off this medication, the drugs and the alcohol was so different like they were more intense. Um, I would get higher, like the high would be more intense. So I started chasing it more. I could stay awake longer. So I started doing more and more and more. And that's when things got really out of control. Um, I started to, you know, I remember sitting on my friend after a festival one night, I think I'd eaten like 14 pills and I was like, okay, I'm going to have one more. Well, I have one more and I ate this pill and I was sitting there and like 20 minutes later, 30 minutes later, I remember my body going like cold, but hot. And I was just sitting there like numb. And I was like, okay, I've, that's it. Like, I've, this is it today. You know, <laughs> this is done. Um, and I still, you know, I would try and get sober. I remember even after that night, I was like, okay, Brooke, like you got to rein it in. Like shit's getting too hectic right now. Um, and I didn't, I would still keep partying. I would still keep chasing the high. And it was a whole group of friends. So I, I'd made some really nice friends out of that rehab that I went to. And they would kind of like support me by planting the seeds and being like, Brooke, you know, I think you should come with us to an AA meeting. And I'd be like, AA is not for me. Like, I don't want to go, but I would go. And it was in there. And I'd realize that, fuck, this, some of these stories, like I actually really like hear them and relate to them. Um, you know, uh, and I would try and give up drinking. I really would. Like I would go, okay, sweet. I'm going to try. And I'd last like two, three months max. Like that was a max maybe three is like pushing it but I think the longest I did was two and then I'd pick up a bottle I was a party girl so I love being vibrant and funny and I was like right skull and coronas where's a bag let's do this three days later 
it would just kind of be the ripple effect. And my downfall from that, especially because I didn't have this medication anymore, was I, my mental health was fucked. Like I was just absolutely fucked. I was having two to three days off work, easy, like a week. I don't know how I maintained a job. I really do not know how I maintained, like kept my job. I would, you know, spend days, like days getting on drugs. Like it would be like, Friday, sometimes Thursday, Friday, Saturday night or Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then go into like Monday morning. And then I think the the scariest moment that made me realize like, holy shit, like you have a problem and you need to get help was it was in December and I had been at a friend's birthday in the city and I was like, I'm not doing drugs. And all my friends were very supportive of this. And I was getting on, I was drinking. And so the city from where I lived in Cronulla was like a 45 minute drive. So it wasn't a, a, you know, jump in an Uber and go 10 minutes down the road. Like it was 120 bucks in an Uber to get there. So we're in the city having a good time. Everyone's drinking, having a great time. I'm drunk. My friend rings me and he, they're like, I've got like, we've got bags, like we're going to get on it. And I was like, sweet, I'm coming. So I jumped in an Uber from the city to Cronulla, got on it with them, stayed up all night. And it was probably like seven o'clock in the morning. And I remember having a line of Coke and feeling like my whole world I don't know what happened, but it just started like shutting down on me. Like everything started, I felt so sick. And I remember looking at him and being like, you like someone needs to get me home. Like I need to go home right now. Anyway, got in a car. Thankfully he lived like just down the road. So I literally like ran into my room and I just started vomiting up blood, like all this blood. I burst all the blood vessels in my eyes. So like all the white part of my eyes were red and my heart. I just remember my heart like racing so fast. And I remember sitting on this, on my bathroom floor, like fully naked going, this is it. I'm going to die. And someone's going to come in here and find me naked on my bathroom floor. And I think it was that moment, that moment. I didn't get sober straight away, but it was that moment that scared the fucking shit out of me. And I thankfully had my auntie come and pick me up. I couldn't even talk to her on the phone. Like I called her and I couldn't talk. And I remember her just being like, well, like what's happened? Like, are you okay? And I'm like, <gasps> like, I couldn't talk. I was like freaking out. And she just got in her car, came and got me. And I had Valium at my house. And I remember I took a Valium. And I was so scared about going to the hospital because the lady who I worked for, like, worked in the ER. And I remember being like, fuck, like, I can't let people find out about this. Like, you know. And my auntie took me back to her house and she, like, nursed me back to health. Like, I just remember laying on her couch, like, a full vegetable, couldn't talk. My face was hurting. My eyes were red from, like, burst blood vessels. Like, it was tragic. And the next day I went to the doctors and the doctor said to me, he's like, you have no idea how lucky you are to be alive. He's like, you could have had a heart attack and basically died. And I think it was that moment hearing those words come out of his mouth. And I knew, I knew that I was, I was borderlining death that day. Like I knew it, I could feel it. And I don't think that's a feeling you can actually make up or like, I don't wish that upon my worst enemy to feel that it was horrible. Mm. And I tried to get sober. I really did. I tried so hard. And I think I lasted like six weeks or something. And the worst part was, is I would get sober. And I just remember being so fucking depressed because I was like, is this what sobriety is like? Like, I can't fucking do this. This is not who I am. So the cycle repeated itself and I kept getting on it and it would just get worse and worse. And I, you know, the benders were getting worse. My 
tolerance was getting worse. So like every time I would get on it, I would have a huge panic attack. I would be vomiting. It would be, it was bad. It was really bad. And I ended up having a good conversation with a friend who was like, Brooke, you need to fucking pull your head in. Like you need to go to rehab. You need to sort your shit out. And I think it was when I, I'd realized that the addiction wasn't the problem. It was actually my mental health and I needed to deal with the whatever traumas, all that shit that had gone on in my past um, that I was masking. I needed to deal with that. So when I, I called the health retreat in um, Keels Mountain and it's a private rehab. So it was very expensive to go there and I couldn't afford it. So I kind of was like, I'm going to check myself back in the South Pacific private. And I don't know, again, I don't know how this happened, but I was called back the next day and they told me, like, you know, basically said, are you going to do the work? And I said, yeah, like, I'll do the work. Like, this is who who I am. Like, you know, they didn't believe in medication, um, you know, like prescription medication, like they weren't going to put medication down my throat is what I mean um, that if I went back to South Pacific private that's it they're going to put me on medication straight away and that's the cycle's going to repeat I wanted to know who I was without anything and they said to me you know you're going to do the work and I said yeah of course I will and he, basically they told me that I had this opportunity where I was sponsored to go there um, and attend the program and I I honestly like it fucking tears me up still to this day because if it wasn't for that, for that and that person who sponsored me, I don't think I would be here to tell this story. And I really think because of that sponsorship is the reason why I take my sobriety so seriously because someone put themselves on the line for me to get the help that I needed and yeah and then I went to Keels Mountain and got jumped on a plane from Sydney I remember it was pissing down with rain it was really stormy and I jumped on the plane and I was so scared I was so so scared but I got here and the sunny coast was sunny and it was warm and I was like I knew it felt right so symbolic it was, it was so symbolic. It was like clouds to sun. And I, my, I did a video last year of my year sobriety and I actually filmed myself on the 22nd of August, which is my sobriety day. And that shows that whole journey, like of me deciding to be sober to going to rehab and, you know, changing my life ever. But yeah, I just remember being fed up, like, fed up I the last bender I had I came home and I laid on the couch because my auntie let me come and live with her she was my biggest support person she was like really trying to help me and for the first time ever she was the one who was listening to me mm. she didn't judge me she listened to me and I think that's the most important thing is we stop judging and we start listening mm. because that's what she did and it helped yeah um but I remember sitting there laying on the pillow and just being like I can't fucking do this anymore like I can't do this I can't live like and thankfully the health retreat saved my life <laughs> yeah that's a it's a fucking crazy crazy story and you've said that to me on Instagram where we chatted and you know you hear those words like okay cool it's gonna be it's gonna be fucking interesting but that was just the craziest like turn. Like you said, it's like there was just waves and a roller coaster ride. Oh, it's, it's, and that's, I've, always, I've got a friend that says to me, she's like, dude, she's like, I don't understand what goes on in your life. She's like, it's always so like, you know, wavy and roller coaster and it mm. has been for a very long time. And I think for the first time in my life since getting sober is now that I've actually started to have be grounded and my life is starting to plateau so it's like it's just mm. the calms yeah. actually well we talked about that in in the support group on fr um friday i think one of your your now friends mentioned how it's about managing the high like keeping the highs not so high and the lows not so low and 
was such a good way to think about it is like plateauing is actually kind of nice <laughs> in a way. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And um, I, I must admit, like it's, it feels good. And I, I am two, two years sober next Sunday. So 12 days away. And I'm, I'm really proud of myself. Like I, I don't think that I'm out of the clear just yet. You know, like I don't think that I'm like, oh yeah, I'm good, but I'm proud of myself because Brooke two years ago would never have thought that she would have got gotten to this point. Mm. At 22, I remember thinking, man, I'd love to do a year sober. You know, I remember just being like so fed up with feeling like shit that I was like, oh, I'd love to do a year sober. Like, surely life would be better. It took me what four years, five years to actually get to that point, and I did it. And to say that now I've gone almost two years sober is for me, it's kind of like, what? Like, yeah. <laughs> did I even used to party? Like, mm. you know, it's, it's, yeah. How, what effect did it have on your friendship group? I know, I know that a lot of your group, it seems like they've st- stuck by you, but have there, has there been an effect from a social point of view that, you know, the people that were in your life around that party stage have for some of them dropped off, dropped off. How has that affected um, that, oh, yeah. absolutely. Like, I think so. Yeah, definitely. I'm blessed to have some really amazing friends who have literally stuck by me through the whole journey, ups, downs, had my back, been there. Um, but of course, you know, naturally, there were friends that I just partied with, you know, they were just my bender friends. And they were friends who I thought I was going to be best friends with for life. But getting sober, you know, they're still there for me in my decisions and what I've done, but those friendships drifted naturally. You know, if the only thing that we had in common was getting on a two day bender, I don't do that anymore. So naturally that's going to change. And I believe in this, that the universe, when doors shut, new doors open, and it was fucking lonely at first, it was hard. And I'm not going to deny that. Like, Mm. Getting sober can be one of the loneliest things you do, but it doesn't last forever because you start to know who you are. And if you start to love yourself enough, the right people start to come into your life Mm. and you have to put yourself out there. Um, You know, learn, also getting sober forced me to have hobbies. Like I had to go and do new things. You know, the only thing I knew how to do was, getting fucked up Mm. I had to change that I literally the only thing I was good at was sculling a corona in like 20 seconds like (laughs) not I was faster than that (laughs) so I had to go and get a better skill set and some new hobbies Mm. you know and that then led me to meet new people Mm. and it's to finish on sort of the the story I think for the people listening you talked about and this is this is um relatable to my story related relatable to probably anyone that has ever experienced mental health challenges from or even addiction as well um from the highest of the highs to the lowest of the lows is that like you said at the time you feel like it's a state you're going to be stuck in forever and it's a state that you're never going to get out of and you identify as that you identify as the guy with depression the girl depression the the person that's anxious all the time never can get through a, cer- a certain social situation without having a panic attack, whatever it might be. But I think it just goes to show like it's taken what you're now two years sober, almost two years sober. It's taken this long for you to get here, but you didn't, you, even though at the time you felt, Oh, I'm fucking stuck. I'm done. Like this is me forever. I'm depressed. I'm anxious. Um, but you're a living example of someone who, it's not going to get stuck in that state. And Fuck no. It's about no way. <laughs> you know, like get shit done. You know, if you need to go to rehab, go to rehab. Don't feel ashamed that you need to go and get help. You know, and I want to clarify this too. Rehab is not just for addiction. Rehab is for mental health too. And to be completely honest with you, 
you deal with your mental health more at rehab than what you do just the addiction because addiction is a band-aid you know to a mental health disorder that's how people cope you got to rip that band-aid off you know face your fucking demons head on face them head on release your traumas acknowledge them call them what they are the best thing i ever did in you know, for my mental health was calling my traumas what they were, calling a rape a rape, calling a sexual assault a sexual assault, calling violence violence, calling manipulation, narcissism, whatever it is, calling it that, acknowledging it, understanding it and fucking releasing it because you don't need to hold on to it. It doesn't belong to you most of the time. It's someone else's shit. Mm -hmm. And the moment I did that was the moment I started to heal. It's like a Band-Aid, right? You have to rip a fucking Band-Aid off for for a wound to heal. But it's going to get messy. It's going to weep a little bit. It's going to be like a little bit gross. Mm. But you have to do that for it to dry up. You have to do that for it to heal. Mm. And the same thing is with mental health, you know, and whatever the fuck you're going through, you will survive it, but face it head on. Yeah. And and David Goggins is a guy that, I'm not probably aligned with from a attitude point of view. I don't know if you know much about David. <laughs> He's very full on and obviously has this attitude that's crazy. And but one thing he talks about is is the calluses on your hands. Um, yeah. And similar thing is that chin ups suck the first couple of times you do it. They suck for the first week, two, three, four weeks. But eventually, your hands callus up. They harden up, and you can do more and more. And it doesn't feel like you're doing as many. Um, and the same thing, like you said. Our scars only harden up when we rip the bandaid off and let air get into it. Yeah. They harden up, aka we harden up, um, in a in a positive way, not in the traditional hard harden the fuck up way, um, because we put little things around us, like the airs of the world, meditation, self help, self care, whatever it might be. So I think that's a really good point that you raised that, and it's a really good segue <laughs> too into into the topic of mental health. But yeah, go on. A hundred percent. Like it's, it's helping. It's yeah. It's it. like what you said, that's that word. Like I think the hard and the fuck up word is, you know, that's half the stigma around mental health. Like, especially men's mental health. It's like those belief systems fuck up. It's not hardening the fuck up from that perspective. It's more, you're getting strength from your traumas by talking about them and healing them from within Mm. um and that's powerful like you know it's it's about building a framework right like when you're dealing with mental health or addiction and this is how I pictured myself as well when I went to rehab I started building the framework to my new life so say for instance you go to Cairns and you buy a house in like cyclone territory that house house's foundation is going to be built to withhold a cyclone right Mm. i need to now build my foundation my framework to withhold and stand a cyclone of addiction and a cyclone of anxiety panic you know all that kind of stuff depression so when the cyclone hits when that cyclone hits it's not going to knock down the whole fucking house It may cause a little bit of damage, but because now that I have the tools, now that I've done the healing, now that I have things like meditation, journaling, art therapy, exercise, hypnotherapy, EFT, whatever, that whole bucket of tools, I now know how to fix my house. And it's not going to be a flat house on the ground. It's just might have a broken window that I need to repair. You know, it's not going to be a complete mess. Yeah. So you're just building as soon as you start your mental health journey, your addiction recovery journey, whatever it is, you're building your new house, you know, and you're building it strong enough because you know that sometimes that cyclone is going to hit and it will triggers are going to come up. You might feel like you want to use one day, but it's like, okay, cool. My house is strong enough to withhold this right now. Mm. The house ain't going to get fucking knocked down. (laughs) it might you know rock a little bit get rattled (laughs) it's gonna get rattled it's gonna lose a window or a door but we're gonna be fine okay you know it's gonna take 
20% effort to fix it, not a hundred. You're not starting from scratch. Mm. And like touching on that mental health side of things, it's really important to understand that you are going, you are going to have up and down days. You are going to have days that you feel shit, you know, this perception of always feeling happy and that, you know, we always have to be skipping around with our smile on our face is bullshit is mm. absolute bullshit. That's not true. That's not true. And that's hard. That's another stigma. Again, we give the people perception that, you know, to be healed and feel great about yourself, you need to always be happy. That's not true at all. Um, because your life is going to go up and down. You're going to have shit days. And I think the biggest thing for myself was understanding that that's okay. That a shit day doesn't mean I have major depressive disorder and I'm sitting in my bed and I'm never going to get out of this, that I'm just having a fucking bad day and I need to allow myself to have that bad day, mm. you know? And, uh, and, and additionally, this is something I learned as well, is a neutral day doesn't mean a bad day either. Like a day where nothing really happens, you just go to work, come home, have dinner, go to bed. I would I used to get really anxious and 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 almost more so depressed about the fact that I wasn't having the best most amazing movie style day and I'd I'd go oh, how embarrassing I need to be doing something whereas now coming from where I was and a terrible mental state you know depressive whatever I I lo- I live for the days where I wake up on a Saturday morning and just take my time just have a coffee, yeah. sit on the couch, look out the window. Oh, it's sunny, beautiful. Let's see what, you know, Koshi's saying on sunrise. Like such a chill like day is so fucking good when you've been through a days where you're like, oh my God, I'm about to like die from just being so depressed. It's, yeah, you don't have to have a good day. Just because you're having a basic day doesn't mean it's a shit day either. Neutral days are my favorite. <laughs> okay. I love a neutral day. I had one yesterday. I was like, you know what? I just kicked back. It was mm. raining up here. I was fluffing around. I kind of cleaned the house a little bit. I listened to some music. I talked to my friend who unfortunately has been in lockdown for like three months in Sydney for like six hours on the phone. We were just laughing and talking. And it wasn't like I had a really, really good day. But I didn't mm. have a bad day. It was just kind of like neutral. Mm. And I allowed myself to do that. I had heaps of stuff I needed to do, but I just didn't do it because I didn't want to, <laughs> you know, and that's okay too. Get to the end of it and you're like, what the fuck have I actually done today? <laughs> <laughs> I literally, it was like nine o'clock at night and I was like on the phone to my friend and to, to the point where we weren't even like talking, we were just like doing other things. And I was like, we've been on the phone for like, literally six hours and for an hour of this we haven't even spoken to each other (laughs) the simple things though it's the simple it was so good and I miss her so much so it was like oh yes I've got you here with me it's like I love it we hung out all day (laughs) (laughs) um so we haven't got ages to go so I just wanted to make sure we touch on these things from now where you are at And, and you did say like you said you're still growing still improving and you're not perfect and none of us are but at the moment when you obviously coach your clients and on your page as well what what's your philosophy around mental health or your general belief around mental health management um, and the concept of it um i think my around mental health is that you know manage especially management of it is we're going, you're going to be, and I'm going to be managing my mental health for the rest of my life because, you know, anxiety is something we all experience to some degree. Some of us have never experienced depression, but most of us will have experienced anxiety at anxiety at one point in our life. Um, And I think with management to mental health is, you know, always keeping that self-care routine in check and allowing yourself to have those good and bad days, accepting that, being okay with that. But filling your cup up first before you fill up someone else's is the most important thing. Um, oh, the door just knocked. Hang on a second. 
I do have pants on, by the way. <laughs> that's okay. I know that's like a trend for girls. Like okay. Wow. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's okay. All good. Should okay. we start that question again? Uh, I don't. Where did you finish? I don't know. You can just go from where you finished if you like. Um. <laughs> I got lost in the like conversation. <laughs> I know. Okay. Wait. Um, so I think my philosophy around mental health and mental health management is that, you know, everyone's mental health is personal and different to them. And I think, you know, acknowledging the fact that it's pretty normal to experience some sort of ill mental health at some point in your life, but understanding the difference between whether it's a mental health disorder and a stressful time in your life is really important so you know we're all going to experience some level of anxiety a lot of us won't ever experience depression but understanding that you know these things will pass and that there is help out there I think the more mental health literacy we make available to people like through your podcast through my page through other people's pages um, and sharing that is the way we can actually break down these stigmas and spread awareness around, um, you know, anxiety, depression, addiction, whatever it is, it, there needs to be more awareness about it because it's not something that is abnormal, you know, or weird or should be taboo. Everyone experiences this to some level at some point in their life, you know, it's anxieties we've been experiencing since the dawn of time. Like we had to run away from saber tooth tigers at some stage in our lives, like, you know, back in the BC times when we were cavemen, but unfortunately due to society's conditionings and, you know, the world around us, things have changed. And that's why anxiety has developed into mental health, a mental health disorder where people are struggling from anxiety so understanding, you know, yourself and speaking to someone about this and trying to differ differentiate whether you are just going through a stressful time or whether you are actually experiencing, you know, ongoing chronic anxiety is really important. So speaking to people about this, speaking to a professional and understanding yourself and your triggers is really, really important. Mm -hmm. Um and the next part of the question was the, what did you ask? Sorry, again. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, that was it. <laughs> that was the, the whole part of the question. Um, okay. That's okay. So I think the, to your point though, what I've, I guess what I, in the think mental sense talk about around the mind is understanding or being self-aware and understanding what you're actually experiencing. And for me, it's self-awareness is probably the one thing that I have a strength in. It's why I do what I do. It's why I am who I am. It's why I work in HR. It's the overarching theme of my life is I am so self-aware that I'm almost too self-aware that I've, thought my way into anxiety and thought my way into certain situations because of the situation, how observant I am in certain situations, how empathetic I am. Um, but in the same sense, it's, it can be so powerful if you just sit there with yourself and, and think and understand what feelings arise when certain things come up, how you feel when you are exposed to certain environments, because you might walk around to your point, you might walk around and get anxious all the time with a certain situation, but you might think, oh, it's just stress. But you might not realise you've actually got some sort of disorder where, or phobia or whatever it might be, but if you don't sit with yourself for a little bit and understand who you are as a person, you're just going to keep going on with life the same way every day, anxious in certain situations, always worried about it. It's exhausting, first and foremost, having to just think about, oh, fuck, I'm going to go through this again today. today. Um, but it's also just, it's just an effort to keep 
fighting and battling, you know? So um, I think it's a really good point around just understanding what your different situations are for sure. I'm so glad you brought that up because that's a huge point is self-awareness is key um, on a mental health journey or an addiction recovery journey. Um, You know, that being self-aware is massive because if you can understand why the, like where this is coming from or being driven from, you have awareness on whether it's coming from a trigger or whether it's an outside stress or things like that. So, you know, there's the iceberg theory where we have, you know, a tip of an iceberg only shows 20% above the water, right? So an iceberg, most of it is down below. There's 80% below the water. If you look at that like your mind, so the 20% is your conscious and the subconscious part is the 80% below, down down there, that's where all the shit's coming from. You know, up here on the 20%, that's surface level stuff. Like, you know, super triggered for some reason up here. But why are we super triggered? Is it actually coming from down here? You know, something that maybe happened to us in our childhood, something that maybe happened to us as a teenager. Is there a trauma there? You know, all zero to birth kind of, I'm sorry, (laughs) zero to now kind of stuff. Like what's going on there? If you can go in there and be self-aware and identify where it's coming from, the emotions, the triggers, and have understanding, we can understand the behavior. So in understanding the reasoning behind the behavior, you then can acknowledge it, have acceptance for it, and do things like release work to get rid of it. And that's why I love tapping because... I can understand a trigger, you know, where this is coming from and tap on it, release it. Um, Because tapping is a way of moving energy within the body. And it does, it does work, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, self-awareness is huge Mm -hmm. because knowledge is power, right? In anything, you know, if you can, if you want to get good at something you study or you want to learn you study and practice and practice, if you can have awareness and study your own mind at a subconscious level, then you have power over your own thinking, over your own triggers and mm-hmm. understand that is it my shit or is it their shit? You know, is it mine or is it theirs? Mm. And so you, you talked about the tapping and the, is EFT tapping as well, or is that too? Simple? Yeah, emotional, emotion, emotional freedom technique. Okay, cool. I don't know why I can't say this tonight. <laughs> so, <laughs> for the listeners, I guess give a bit of an overview of what some things you do, habits, routines, tools, whatever you use in your own tool, be- uh, tool belt, um, and things that people might be able to try for their own mental health that you think can help. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, I don't know if I mentioned this already, but self-care and a self-care routine and having that toolbox packed up to the rim is the most important part of a mental health and addiction recovery journey. Um, Having that routine daily is huge. And I can speak from experience when I spoke earlier about, you know, a couple of months ago when I was having that, you know, suicidal thoughts and my mental health had slipped. I can honestly sit here and tell you it's because I took the foot off the pedal for my self-care routine and I let it slip because at a point I was feeling good and I was like, yeah, I'm sweet. I'm really doing great, but they're the moments you need to do it the most. Um, So in my toolbox, I suppose I meditate daily. So morning and night, I do list structures because I'm an anxious feel like I may potentially have ADHD kind of person. So a list helps me every single day, ticking that off. It gives me structure and balance throughout the day. Um, I journal and I do tapping. Um, I don't tap or journal every single day. It depends on how I'm feeling. So I do have a list next to my bed of all my tools on my, in my toolbox. And I go, okay, you know what? I'm going to do this today. And this tonight accompanied with my medic 
um, meditation practices. Um, breath work, simple breath work techniques really are helpful. Um, so simple like box breathing or doing a four by four. So breathing in for four, holding for four and exhaling for four. I can honestly tell you anyone who is listening, if you are having a panic attack or you are struggling with anxiety and you're feeling doing this technique will instantly make you feel better. Give it a couple of rounds and I promise you, you will start to feel connected to yourself. If you are in a panic attack and you do this breathing, once you open your eyes, go around the room and start to say things out loud that you can see. By doing this, you're grounding yourself. You know, it's it's a really simple thing to do and it's quick and it's easy. You know, you breathe, you open your eyes and you start saying things out loud that you can see and it will help you, it will ground you. Um, I also try to, you know, this is might not be a daily practice, but I try to be as creative as possible as much as I can. So I paint, I use spray paint, I make stencils, I like to get wild and throw shit and like, you know, it's a good release for me. Um, exercise, being outdoors is a must. I try to do that every single day if I can. Um, I know if I'm spending too much time in my house, self-awareness, again, that something's not in check, something's not aligned. Am I slipping a little bit? You know, is there a trigger that I'm not dealing with because I'm obviously feeling a little bit anxious or depressed, even if I'm not acknowledging it to myself. So just keeping myself in check. Um, but also being flexible, like having a good day. Like if I just want to have a day where I chill, I make sure I still do my meditation and keep that routine in check. Mm. But I allow myself to have a break. Like sometimes the best thing you can do for yourself is order a pizza and sit and watch some Netflix for a day. That's self-care too, you know, that that's okay. Mm. You don't yeah. always have to be on the ball. Yeah, and that's a, something I've, I've talked to you about uh, with other guests is around that hustle grind mentality of like, I need to do something every day. I need to do stuff, do stuff, do stuff. And and for people with mental health, sometimes doing stuff all the time is is worse for you than just stopping and having a break. Like you said, it's Anxiety. so important. What, what do we do when we're anxious? We're like, oh my God, I need to do this. I need to do that. I need to do this. I need to do that. Like, dude, chill, like yeah. stop breath you know and by the way the worst thing to say to someone if they're having a panic attack is chill so don't ever do that <laughs> even though I just said that not do that yeah. um but you know like you do need to just actually chill you know relax like you know if you mm. want to sit at home and eat a pizza or watch Netflix or you know just be by yourself that's okay too we don't always have to be doing like that perception that we always need to be happy or we're depressed mm. no we're not yeah. we're not yeah. I'm allowed and have every right to feel sad I have every right to feel angry you know these are warranted emotions it's about learning how when they become negative in our life you know like anger is it rage or are you turning your anger into strength you know is your sadness because you're feeling sad or is it going into that more depressive state mm. we're mm. allowed to feel like this you don't yeah. have to be happy all the time mm. but doing things like journaling um is a big thing for anyone who's listening out there like please by all means go and buy yourself a journal start a gratitude list every single day write three things you're grateful for that's another thing i do daily and if things start to arise write them down write about your experiences in depth until you cannot write anymore and then from your knowledge and your learnings throughout life try and look at that from a different perspective how can you find a positive outlook to that experience how can you find value from that experience and then rewrite that, create a new neural pathway in your brain. By rewriting a story, it's it's really powerful. I do it often. Like a lot of my traumas or say there's like a trigger throughout the day and something's really irked me. 
I'll write it down and I'll keep writing so it's out of my head. And then at the end, I will summarize and almost like write myself a new way to look at that. Like was, even though this experience may have not been the best, what did I gain from that that was positive? How can I look at that in a different perspective? So then in my brain, it's leaving that nice little note that, yeah, okay, that was not the best outcome or not the best experience, but you actually learned X, Y, Z that you didn't learn before and it gave you strength and it gave you courage or it made you compassionate or it did this or did that or, you know, whatever it is. I now I'm looking at it from a positive perspective and that's just simple cognitive brain therapy, you know, mm. change it. Yeah. And uh, I, I really want to keep going <laughs> with all of that, but I'm conscious of time. I wanted to ask you one more question that I ask everyone and um, you can answer it from the perspective of yourself or anyone out there, but if you had to give yourself or other people from your past or let me start that again. <laughs> let me start the question. Can I fucked it? <laughs> that's the first time hey, I've ever fucked okay. that. That's okay. You're allowed. You're allowed uh, no, that's, um, I've, that's the first time I've ever fucked it up a question and had to restart it. So okay. Um, okay. I, yeah, I really liked that. Oh, my brain's fucked. <laughs> What are you doing to me? I've never done this before. It's been a lot. I'm not going to lie. My brain's like, oh, we've yeah. just talked so much. <laughs> yeah. Oh, fuck no. no, it's great. Um, okay. Well, let me just think about two seconds. Um, what were we talking about? <laughs> um, I think you were going to ask me a question and you said you can say it from your perspective now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I know the question. Yeah. Okay. We we're talking about um, like journey my life. Okay. Yeah, I, I really want to keep going with this, but actually we don't have much long left in the, the actual podcast. But I do ask this question to everyone um, that I have on. If you had advice for your younger self or someone else that's younger out there, what do you think that one piece of advice would be now, knowing what you know now? That there are people who will listen to you and there are people who will help you through what you're going through. And what you're going through now is going to become your story and give you the strength to help other people, to be compassionate, to live an amazing life. And it doesn't last forever. And don't you fucking dare throw in the towel because this too shall pass. It always does. Lovely. I think that was, I that was perfect. <laughs> No, that was perfect. And I think it's for your younger self, but also for other young people out there. It's, um, I think that is such a cool saying that I use all the time for myself, even when I'm having a panic moment, you know, this too shall pass just like it did the other time. Um, and on my wrist, I have remember when tattooed and, and that's been there for, uh, since I started my mental health journey, because every day you go through something new, that's, quote unquote depressive or anxious an anxious moment or just a you know a sad day you just gotta remember when like you were you went through it one one day you can go through it another day and come out the other side Absolutely. very cliche but um yeah it's, it's cliche I, but it's it's cliche but it's like simple and it works because it's fucking true like it yeah. does pass if I look back at every time that I sat in my bed and felt like I wanted to die and then I didn't do it and I didn't, you know, I woke up maybe a couple of days later or whatever and actually felt good again. Mm. It always passes. It passes. It never lasts forever. You might have a doubt, like a, a bit of a burst of it and it might last for a couple of days and sometimes a week, sometimes longer, but it always passes. Mm. Always. Yep. Nothing in life cannot be worked through Agreed. and nothing that happens to us is worth ending our lives over. And I think that's my biggest message is you are not your traumas. You are not 
you know, your mental illness. You are not your addiction. You are worth so much more than that. And there always is a light at the end of the tunnel. Mm. Always. Always. So to finish off, give us all your handles. Tell us where, where people can find you. Um, and anything else that you think you need to promote that will be valuable for people out there? Sure. Um, So my page is at The Anxiety Bender, um, all one word. And my support group, Fuck Stigmas, is for anyone, men and women, who want to come and feel connection and speak. They don't have Um, you know you can come and listen we talk about tips we talk about tricks we have other coaches on there as well we have people there who want to share their stories everyone is welcome Um, it is an over 18s platform but you know anyone who's over 18 is welcome to come and join in fuck stigmas and if you want to come along send me a dm and i can hook you up with the link to that when i release them each week um And then also the in crowd is another non-for-profit organization that I work alongside um, with Kurt, uh, the founder of the in crowd. So at the moment we're doing homelessness support uh, within the community. So if anyone would like to get behind that or would like to be involved or want to find out how they can, you know, donate or be a part of, please again, um, contact us on Instagram, which is at underscore in underscore no the underscore in underscore crowd um or send me a message on instagram and i can point you in the right direction um we also offer community support for disability and mental health as well and i suppose um my biggest thing is you know if you are struggling and my advice to anyone is don't be afraid to go and speak your truth and tell your story, like go and speak to someone, you know, um, there are mental health care plans that doctors can give for you to go and see a psychologist, which offer 10 sessions um, with them, like with the Medicare rebate and stuff like that. So utilize these things, um, talk to your doctor, talk to your friends, talk to your mom, talk to your dad, get out there, um, try different things, try hypnotherapy, try holistic healing, speak to counselors, try art therapy, just try it all. Give everything a go. Um, it's not going to hurt you. It's going to help you heal. And it may not be, be for you something that you try, but at least you gave it a go. Um, and that's the beauty of this is there's so many different things out there that we can try and do, um, that we can use. And, utilize to help us that give it a go if music is your way of release go and start playing music you know if art is utilize your creativity um yeah I think that's my biggest thing is don't be afraid to you know speak up and don't be afraid to start healing Mm because healing isn't as scary as what it seems it's actually really beautiful and it's fucking fun like Honestly, it's, I've never had so much fun in my life and I haven't touched drugs or drunk once in two years and I'm having a ball. Mm. Like it's great. So yeah. Well, that's a good way to end. And I, I do appreciate you coming on because I know that it was a really big moment for you to be able to speak this for the first time verbally. And I do, I said, said it before, I'm, so super grateful that I, I get to be the one to to ask questions about it and that's the beauty of this platform we met randomly through someone sharing you and you know I know but, how cool yeah. I love social media when it's used for good <laughs> yeah so <laughs> we'll end it there but I, I I know that we'll keep in touch and uh, if anyone has any questions or wants to give us feedback via either you know Brooklyn's page or through mine just let us know give us feedback we do appreciate it um and for anyone who hasn't followed us on social media I specifically think mental at the moment we're nearly at a thousand followers which not (laughs) not for I I don't want the the accolades or the whatever it's more our our mission as a as an organization uh and more so podcast is to reach 100,000 people so if you haven't already go give us a follow it's thinkmental underscore 
um, share with your friends. We just, I just want to reach as many people as possible. It's a free resource. It always will stay a free resource. So just um, thank you everyone so far. And there's a, a, a pretty cool giveaway coming for your thousand followers. So um, yeah, an incentive for, for you to share it. But um, thanks again, Brooke, Brookie G. Appreciate your time. <laughs> Thanks, Jimmy. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you. And uh, it's been talk. fun. And thank you all for listening. I'm sorry if my nerves took over a little bit at some point, but <laughs> I'm used to writing and I know I can't shut up sometimes, but it's um it's weird when you talk about yourself. Yeah, it is. When you're a humble <laughs> when you're a humble person, some people would love it. But... <laughs> oh, thanks, Jimmy. Thank you.